John Hospers wrote one of the 20th century's most important clarifications of classical liberal thought. He served as the Libertarian Party's first presidential candidate in 1972 and has been an influential thinker and spokesman for liberty for the last half century. But he wasn't always so interested in political ideas. In fact, his early career was headed in a very different direction. John Hospers was born in a small town in Iowa that had been settled by Dutch immigrants in 1847. He learned to speak Dutch before he learned to speak English. And the Dutch Reformed Church dominated the life of the small town. As Hospers grew up and began to think critically about the church and its influence, he experienced what he would later recognize as his first interest in philosophical thought. After receiving a master's degree in literature from the University of Iowa, he received a scholarship to Columbia University, where he completed a PhD in philosophy with a major field of study in the philosophy of art. Then came an unexpected meeting at Brooklyn College in 1960, where he attended a lecture by the noted and controversial author Ayn Rand. After the lecture, Rand graciously agreed to give this young, relatively unknown philosopher an hour of her time for lunch. An hour turned into five. And there began a unique friendship and ongoing intellectual discussion that would greatly influence the development of Hosper's ideas in the coming years. Not until I met Rand did I really see the need for a systematic delineation of the, of the position. I had impressions, most largely from my childhood. I had some convictions, but it, I, I didn't really find politi political philosophy even very respectable at the time. I was really rather bored by most of the historical authors and political philosophy. I much preferred to read aesthetics or epistemology or, or ethics. Uh, it, it, the, the, and so I was, it was very late in the game before I came on to those authors. After joining the philosophy department at the University of Southern California in the 1960s, Hospers expanded his focus beyond aesthetics to begin a far-ranging and thoughtful engagement with the ideas of liberty through such works as Human Conduct and Libertarianism, one of the defining works of libertarian philosophy. His books, Understanding the Arts and An Introduction to Philosophical Analysis, are also very influential philosophical works. John Hosper served as head of the philosophy department at the University of Southern California from 1968 to 1988. In 1972, he was called away for a brief time from the academic world to the world of politics when he was asked to become the Libertarian Party's first ever presidential candidate. The odds were against a third party candidate winning the presidential election, but Hospers took a philosophical view of his role seeing it as an opportunity to make a more public statement of important classical liberal principles. At the same time, I thought, look, here's an opportunity. I remember what Rand says, you know, uh, the world of ideas is the only one in the end that counts in this world. And if, if, if you don't give them good ideas, other people are gonna give, them give that same audience bad ideas. I developed little slogans of my own when so somebody would say, if you're elected, what will you do for me? I developed a stock response. I will leave you alone to fulfill your own goals without interference from me. John Hospers is currently Professor Emeritus at USC, where he still lectures and teaches and continues to give a unique and inspiring voice to the ideas of freedom. Liberty Fund welcomes you to a conversation with Professor John Hospers. Do you recall what were the first distinctively philosophical issues that uh, occupied your mind as a young person? I think the first distinctively philosophical issues were philosophical issues connected with th theology. 
for example? Oh, the problem of predestination. Um, the problem of Calvinist theology of perseverance of the saints. That if you're ever really converted, can you ever go back the other way? Or does the fact that you do prove that you never had it in the first place? I mean, there's intricate methodological questions like that. Is your, were your, was your interest in, in the free will question, um, can it be traced back to this Calvinist uh, theological position that yes, very much. Uh, there is yeah. predestination? Yeah. How much of an influence in retrospect, now that you understand your life as an adult, do you think these questions were on you, not just as a professional intellectual, but also as a person, as, a, as, as, a, as the human being you've become. They were very important. Uh, whether it was, whether I adopted the sense of acceptance or rejection, or simply not understanding, or just thinking it over, or mulling it over in, our, in my mind, uh, th those were the determinants of a whole host of subsequent philosophical questions that I addressed to myself. Was the community at this early period of your life such that it hemmed you in, that it, that it constrained your thinking or at least your expressive expressions on these matters? Some people, it did. And in a way, I was fortunate. Uh, my father didn't really give a damn one way or the other. Mm -hmm. But he, because of my mother and other relatives, he went along and never talked about it at all. Uh, and my mother, too, was not as doctrinaire as some of, of her relatives, you know. So uh, as long as uh, I was sort of cultivated the right habits in life and uh, thought not too dissimilarly from what the preacher said, or at least as long as I didn't express that disagreement, uh, I, that's, that's about as far as it went with her. I was, I was influenced by community, my community in that way. But you see, I was also influenced by relatives in this way. My rel a lot of my relatives didn't have much to do with the Dutch reform. They had gone out of the, the community and they hadn't returned. But I remember when one, one uncle, after Roosevelt was reelected, saying this, we'll never see low taxes again. And the other one said, this is the end of freedom in America. And I still remember in 1936, how this sort of haunted me. How is it going to affect my life if this is the end of freedom in America? This uncle was a close friend of Fred Maytag, who founded the Maytag washing machine and so on company. And they remain close friends throughout their lives. So I got a lot of indirect in intake about free enterprise and how to fight the government and so on from, from <laughs> indirectly from Fred Maytag, although he never knew it. You had some interest in astronomy, I understand, at one point. Oh, yes. I started reading about that uh, at you know, 10 years old, read everything in the library and the encyclopedia. Then when I became a freshman in college, uh, the dean who taught the astronomy course said to me, you know more astronomy than I do, so why don't you take it over? So there I was, a 17-year-old. I was teaching college juniors and seniors. Uh, astronomy, or I'd be taking them out to the observatory at 5 o'clock in the morning to watch the rings of Saturn and so on and so on. So uh, when you went to Columbia, uh, were you beginning to get aware of uh, the reigning philosophical schools? Well, I would started on analytic philosophy with Sellers and Feigl at Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, and, but of course, I started to learn much more about that. Columbia was not very good at analytic philosophy, really, except for Ernest Nagel. Mm -hmm. uh, but Erwin Edmund was the aesthetics man, and I studied under him because my PhD thesis, which later became a book, was entitled Meaning and Truth in the Arts. Yes. Because subsequently, some philosophers associate you with the uh, ordinary or, or common sense philosophy yeah. of Moore. I was always skeptical of philosophical systems. Uh, though I liked them, I found I was found them aesthetically more interesting than conceptually. So yes, I took to G. E. Moore. What is most memorable in Moore is the meticulous way in which he handled each issue. Everybody else might 
think that Moore had cleared something up and there's no more conceptual confusions and, uh, uh, and but Moore would stick at it uh, stick with it and there there would there, be more things that he'd have to clear up in his own mind and that influenced me when people ask me what's your aesthetic theory and I, I, I say that's not really the way I came come at it I have a nose for certain problems. A certain problem attracts me, and then I want to do something with it. Uh, people say, art is expression. I say, what does that mean? Uh, does it mean that the artist is in some way expressing himself, or expressing something about the world, or, or what? So, for instance, there's the sense of expression in which a person is said to express himself or express some feelings. Wordsworth, I, the idea of poetry as the expression of emotion would have been unintelligible to aesthetic theory a hundred years before that. But, uh, and, but it's very prevalent even today. You go to a student at an easel and say, what are you doing? I'm expressing myself. That seems the natural way of, of putting it, expression as a process. But sometimes when, uh, and, 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 and expression is the process, says Collingwood, of finding within yourself something that's inchoate and gradually bring it out. And when you do so and it becomes articulate, then you are relieved and so on. That's the classical expression theory in one of its several forms. But you see, when you talk about expression in art in other ways, you're not talking about a process at all. Anyway, to make the long story short, what I tried to do in that uh, is the sort of, it's the way I do philosophy. I don't mean mm -hmm. it's the best way to do it or it's the only thing to do, but I take a, sort of a confused concept or maybe just a word that seems to have several related meanings, but they do seem to be somehow related and then sort of work on that. And not just reading, but asking people, or I note how they say, or note what they say, and then wonder, why did they say it in, in this way? What's on their minds that distinguishes what they said here from what they said over there? That, that, that's the way I work. You have a big book, Meaning and Truths in the Art. Yes. Uh, in the Arts, and um, this is a sustained work. This is not just bits and pieces, so... Uh, you, even though you're not so theoretically minded, you yeah. somehow managed to put together a rather serious treatise here. Uh, how does that square with your more, uh, how should I say, piecemeal philosophical approach? A doctor in dissertation has to be scholarly. Mm -hmm. And so there was quite a bit of scholarly stuff in, in, in that uh, dissertation uh, because there's several concepts uh, involved. Uh, meaning and then truth, the cognitive value of art, uh, and in what way might it be cognitive? Well, we speak of true sentences, and then I went from true to what is implied in true sentences. Like when we say they had children and got married, are we implying that they had the children first, or could we be, uh, be committed to that in a court of law? That's sort of, on the other hand, more broadly, we speak of truth in art, especially in literature, a character is true to human nature in some sense, or this is true to the way uh, the, that England was in the 19th century at the time of Thomas Hardy, and so on. Do you have any opinions uh, on the current uh, sort of challenge toward any sort of meaning in the, uh, in the arts that comes from uh, postmodernist, deconstructionist uh, uh, circles? Depends on what's meant by meaning. If the meaning is inherent in it in some way, or if the meaning is read into it, if the meaning really lies in the observer. Well, uh, we could it's, it's, change the word meaning to say grasping what it is about and understanding uh, of it, or is that all a myth and it's all kind of catches catch can ask can. what it's about and what how it can be construed as being. Though you might go to the director or the or, or the author and say, oh no, I didn't have any such thing in mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, Robert Frost often said that sort of thing as sort of a put down to people who read all kinds of uh, meanings into his work. Mm -hmm. 
It was in connection with aesthetics that you met the rather famous uh, American cultural figure, Ayn Rand. Uh, give us a little bit of that. Well, she was invited to speak at Brooklyn College, which I she see. did, and I was in the audience and uh, asked to whether I could have a few words with her. She said, please do. I'm limited to one hour, and five hours later we were still sitting in the cafe uh, talking eagerly about all kinds of subjects. She then invited me to one of the Nathaniel Brandon Institute lectures. Mm -hmm. uh, she invited me to the one on aesthetics. Uh, and then later she invited me to her home uh, and it became a regular thing. Every two weeks or so I'd spend an evening discussing with Ayn Rand, uh, usually from eight in the evening until two or four o'clock in the morning. And uh, we would discuss every conceivable thing, but she, uh, I had just read, been reading Atlas, so she wanted me to first... Her book, book Atlas Shrugged. Her book novel, Atlas Shrugged. And so the first thing that she wanted me to do is give my considered reflections on Atlas, which I did. We spent two or three full evenings on that. And I was especially taken by the intricate structure of the book, and I told her what I, why I thought so well of it as I did. I'm sure none of this was news to her, and I couldn't imagine at the time why she wanted me to talk about Atlas th that much. I only learned later that the book had just come out a couple of years before and had received overwhelmingly unfavorable reviews. And so she was caught between these unfavorable reviews and the unthinking adulation that she had from certain disciples. So she wanted something, so to speak, from the horse's mouth. Uh, she wanted uh, someone who was trained in philosophy as well as the arts uh, to uh, respond to some of her needs. And these were, those were emotional needs, I think, of, at that time. Now, she uh, has always proclaimed herself to be a rather systematic thinker, and even though much of her thinking, even in aesthetics, is sketchy, it was nevertheless supposedly very systematic. You, on the other hand, were a problem solver. How did the two of you manage to reconcile these differences? Well, she certainly considered herself to be a problem solver, too. I often wished that instead of being uh, going to college in uh, Leningrad, that she had gone through Cambridge or Oxford for a a couple of years of thorough, rigor rigorous philosophical training, but she never did. And it was amazing how far she could get in philosophy quite on her own, but sometimes she and I didn't quite speak the same language, and it, it, it took a while to adjust the one to the other. Now, when did you find out that uh, Rand's politics and your politics tended to converge? fairly early on. You see, I read Atlas and I had gone through many aspects of Atlas with her, but some, some parts, believe it or not, I even read aloud to her and she wanted that and she, she wanted to, to hear this. And so when I read the, the section of the, the tramp on the train uh, that Dagny comes across, I, I later read that every year to my ethics class, uh, but at any rate, the first reading of it, in part, was to Rand herself. And sure, I had no problem picking up and accepting, for the most part, the political aspects of this. This seemed to me natural. I remember as a as a kid, I had uh, I had thought this: when the government builds a house, people don't even take care of it for for you. Uh, if you rent it, then you may take better care of it, but if you own it, that's when you take good care of it. And that was an early reflection of mine. Or similarly, the uh, well, abuse of people on welfare uh, when they tended to do more and more and attract more fa uh, families into the welfare net. Uh, I was sort of onto that fr from the beginning. I was an individualist right from the start. Given that you had been a problem solver, and looked upon even political convictions more in, in that vein. Uh, did you ever come to share the conviction of the major classical philosophers like Plato, Aristotle, and even some modern ones like Marx and Rand, that politics needs a sort of integrated, uh, massive foundation? Let me 
say this first by way of attempted reply. I had always thought that uh, socialism was rather silly and I couldn't see what people saw in it. And not until I met Rand did I really see the need for a systematic delineation of the, of the position. I had impressions most largely from my childhood. I had some convictions, but it, I, I didn't really find politi political philosophy even very respectable at the time. I was really rather bored by most of the historical authors and political philosophy. I much preferred to read aesthetics or epistemology or, or ethics. Uh, it, it, mm -hmm. the, 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 and so I was, it was very late in the game before I came onto those authors. Uh, like at all. capitalism versus socialism, individualism, right. collectivism, these things only came later in your. I, those terms came later. Mm -hmm. Collectivism and so on. I, I had to have Ayn Rand explain to me what that all meant. Right. That's how unfamiliar I was with the terms. But what the reference of those terms I had been acquainted with off and on throughout throughout my life through being raised the way I was in the environment that I was. You know, you um, wrote this very very famous book, Introduction to Philosophical Analysis, and uh, you uh, it practically became the how-to-do book yes. in analytic philosophy. Uh, how was it received initially, and uh, could you still uh, appreciate the more massive approach to political philosophy uh -huh. given that methodological approach? I have to tell you something about how that book came to be. I had just gone to join the department at Minnesota, and I had all sorts of things that had to be done at once. But I suddenly got inspired, as inspired that as I've ever been in my life. I think, uh, one little inspiration after another, it ended up as the first hundred pages of the introduction to philosophical analysis. Those hundred pages were entitled "Words and the World," and I conceived of them as sort of a new way to introduce people to philosophy. I thought it was the way to introduce people to philosophy, but first through definitions of terms then through talk about emotive language and about ostensive definition and all the things like that that I felt students had a crying need for and which they weren't getting. They were being fed stuff in their courses which uh, if they had only gotten this other material that could have, could have avoided lots of confusions. So I spent several months on that hundred pages, but I still remember the, the fire in my belly when, when, when I had that, that going. I didn't know whether the book, the completed book, would, would be a success or not. I, it was adopted instantly by the University of California and then a lot of other places. It was a famous book at the time. It's subsequently gone through many editions. It's gone through four editions. The last one came out four years ago. And there's some relics of the old in it, and there's a lot of new things and a lot of new approaches. Uh, but nothing in my mind will ever equal the enthusiasm which I felt for that initial project and the way it turned out in those first hundred pages. I still have a hard time looking at it without, without tears being shed. But you know, one of the things about you is that have you have remained eclectic. You've always yeah, kept your yeah. feet in many dimensions of philosophy rather than just specialized in political philosophy or philosophy of law. You've taught philosophy of law, you've taught all of these things, and yet you're not what you might call an integrationist. You didn't have a full, there is no Hosper system, you know, out there. Uh, do you find that to be very much the reflection of your nature or your conviction? Well, I've got a lot of different interests, and when people have told me, so you would have done much better professionally in your life if you had stuck to one subject, like aesthetics or philosophy of law, and not done anything else, then you could have been famous for, for that and just that one thing. And, and you haven't done that. You've spread yourself too thin. And I reply, that's true. Uh, but I, 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 way, I went the way my interests led. Let me bring to light perhaps some of the liabilities of this choice, because you had written on a number of subjects, and then when other people looked at these subjects, they sometimes saw conflict. For example, 
you were the first to examine the implications of psychoanalysis on the free will determinism issue. And you seem to have come down something of a determinist, at least at that time. But then later, when it came to political philosophy and to ethics, you clearly seem to have been committed to the idea that people can make genuine choices. And so that seemed like put you at odds with yourself. Did you ever feel that? I never felt at odds with myself, but some people have pointed out to me that I should have felt at odds with myself because there was a contradiction. I never thought that there was a, a, a contradiction. But if no. a person is indeed kind of driven by subconscious or even, to use the Freudian term, unconscious motivations, uh, which basically take over his life, then the idea that he ought to do the one thing rather than the other thing and is blameworthy for not having done so seems to fall out of the picture, doesn't it? That's a long story, but let me preface it in this way. When Sidney Hook took my essay in his anthology and he retitled it without my authorization, he retitled it, What Means This Freedom? Mm -hmm. uh, and I said in the, in the article, I said, I'm not saying, I'm not taking any sides on determinism versus indeterminism. What I said is, here, here are a number of areas of life uh, which Freud had begun to make famous through slips of the tongue and other unconscious mechanisms. And I, what I wanted to show in that essay was that these are much more frequent than we think and much more uh, take over parts of our lives. But I never said, and in fact I indicated in the, in, in the paper, that this was not to be taken as a sanction of total uh, determinism because it certainly was not. It did not exclude areas of, of, of freedom. It just showed one source, one source which is underappreciated mm -hmm. of how we think we are free to do this when in fact uh, we're not. But it is an I interesting did, question I, yeah. at what point a person can exculpate himself or herself on the basis of these influences and at what point they don't work and where is that dividing line? That is a serious question. That's a very tough question and I grapple with that every time I read an article on some serial killer and so on and so on. In the case of the serial killer, I say, sure, he's uh, more sick than evil or you might say he's both sick and evil but at any rate, uh, that this is sick in some in, in some important sense seems to be undeniable in the in, in the way these people behave. They seem to be utterly driven by something that they cannot control themselves. Okay, but that applies to, to some people. It doesn't apply to all people. It doesn't apply, as far as I know, to you and me and most of the people that we get along with. We make our own decisions. We're influenced. We're not slaves. We're not, sl not slaves of desire. We're not slaves of uh, theory. Uh, but as philosophers we are often called upon to offer criteria by which to make those determinations. This person fits the classification of being helpless, being driven. Mm -hmm. This person does so to some extent and this person made the choice and should suffer the consequences flat out. Are we able as philosophers to provide that or is that really a hopeless task? I don't know if it's hopeless. I just think there's so many difficulties in the way that we, we cannot speak with any great confidence. Here's a man who has been, uh, who's going to be, uh, suffer the, the death penalty. Uh, but when we see how he was abused as a child uh, and uh, didn't have a father that he could ever make any confidence in, and so on and so on. You can go through the whole scenario, and then you can ask, well, how could he really help it? Well, that, at one point he did make a decision. He, he decided to kill this person, so he said, uh, so that was his, his decision. Yeah, but on the other hand, it was done through a momentary impulse, uh, and we could read uh, psychiatric reports of how suddenly he was... He was flooded uh, by certain images, and as a result of that, he stabbed her because she reminded him of the mother that he hated and still the mother whose affection he wanted, and so on. Uh, these well, are familiar stories. I, I don't know what to say about a lot of these.
When it comes to areas like politics, however, where we need long-term policies, commitments, where we can't just vacillate every moment, you do commit yourself to a certain general approach yeah. and reject many alternatives. And it's how do you manage to do that in that area? Th things like the free market and the free enterprise system seem to me so obvious at this stage of my life uh, uh, that, that it just seems to me anyone is foolish who does not go along with that. But on the other hand, there are many things that are less certain to me international relations. At what point should the United States cut off diplomatic relations? When should we form alliances or should we at all, uh, should we say declare war or respond to somebody else's declaring war? These are terribly difficult questions and I, I've certainly, I'm not certain about these the way I'm certain about things like a free economy. You have to take them all separately and each one differs in some critical way from the other ones. So you can't take the one, so one problem or one solution and then apply it unchanged to the next problem that comes along because if you do, you'll probably be wrong. Sometimes they, are, they call this a pragmatic approach to, to politics and foreign policy. Would you uh, buy into that? I think a pra pragmatic approach to international relations is what's uh, called for. Uh, pragmatic in the sense that we try to get the, the best possible outcome, and, uh, adhering as closely as possible to peaceful resolution of, of all disputes and so on. This, uh, I remember when I mentioned to Ayn Rand that we have to be pragmatic about things like that. And she instantly, she, here was one of her least favored terms. She said, what, you're a pragmatist? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm, I'm not a pragmatist in the sense that of adhering to the philosophy generally called pragmatism. Mm -hmm. But uh, in international relations, we just have to be practical. I don't know of any overriding theoretical solution to all these things. You have to take them piecemeal, piecemeal, one at a time, study it out. This is, that doesn't lend itself to quick and easy solutions by people who want to forget about the facts or not investigate all the facts and just jump at a solution, say, hey, we should stay out of this one. Well, you know, in 1972, you ran as the Libertarian Party candidate for the President of the United States. So you must have, even though it wasn't probably likely that you're going to win, but you must have given some thought to how you would treat these international questions, where by some chance you'd be elected president. Yes, I thought about it and was in a way glad that at this point uh, that situation would not arise of my becoming president. At the same time, members of the USC faculty were already clamoring to be Secretary of State and Secretary of the Treasury. <laughs> uh, so you were like William F. Buckley when, had he had been elected mayor of New York, he would have demanded a recount. Exactly, <laughs> yes. What happened, by the way, that was an interesting part of your career. The Libertarian Party was formed with an effort to spread the ideas of classical liberalism throughout America, and they selected you as a, a party candidate, the candidate. Tell us Those were exciting it. times. I mean, uh, I would never have got, let myself in for that, so to speak. Never would have become uh, joined the Libertarian Party had it not been for the influence of Ayn Rand. Not that she was in favor of this particular political party. But I remember things that she'd say, like when I would be discouraged with uh, my luck with students or I wasn't having success with this or, or courses were becoming repetitious. And she'd say to me things like this, you intellectuals, you have the most, the most influential position in the world. Uh, the world can do without a certain amount of material goods, but they cannot do with a big dose of bad ideas and your mission in life should be to get rid of the bad ideas as far as you can and substitute good ones. At the time when she said this to me and other things like it, I had no idea about running for political office. That was the farthest thing from my th But I thought of it later. You see, it, 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 all, it all went into the little stewing pot of my brain and uh, it, it came out. Uh, yes, I was asked to write a book on libertarianism, uh, which to a large extent was ran, but a few others as well. 
So I did. I signed the contract. I wrote the book. It came out in 1971. It's long since out of print now because the publisher is no more. At any rate, it was very influential at the time. Most of all, I think, in the in this 1972 first National Libertarian Convention. Dave Nolan had started the Libertarian Party in his living room in Colorado Springs, but it only became national when he sent out invitations up to many other people, myself included, to please get together in Denver at a certain date in June, and we'll see if we can form a political party. So I went eagerly thinking, well, at least we'll have have some input on the platform and a few other things. As it turns out, uh, there were about a hundred and some people there. I wrote the Statement of Principles, which was adopted, still is the, the Statement of Principles for the party. And then they decided, almost as an afterthought, to float a presidential candidate. Or they first asked, should we have one? Are we ready for that? Or should we do this at all? And then they decided, lopsided majority vote, Yes, we should have a presidential candidate. Uh, so, well, it all started. Uh, by the end of June of 1972, there I was, presidential candidate. I had an itinerary made out for me, crisscrossing the country a couple of times at various whistle stops. Uh, uh, I had never made political speeches before. I gradually learned how to do it. I learned sort of what was most difficult for me to make an unqualified statement when I thought it should be qualified for the sake of accuracy, you know. And uh, I hated to, to do that sort of thing. The sound bite. The, the sound bite te technique. But people would say, you know, the reporter would say, okay, what are you gonna do with the poor, let them starve? And before I had a chance to answer, because it would take quite some doing to, 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 to answer that adequately, uh, then another question with some savagery would be, would be thrown at me. I developed little slogans of my own. I mean, uh, when so somebody would say, if you're elected, what will you do for me? I developed a stock response. I will leave you alone to fulfill your own goals without interference from me. Now, some people, people who are real or potential libertarians, they like that, that something in, in them responded to that. But other people thought that as an answer, this was a nothing. You know, I thought it should have been the most important answer that any political candidate could give to a voter. Mm -hmm. I will not interfere with your life. But, no. You know, just at the same time, or c almost at the same time, you also took over that journal, The yes. Personalist yes. at USC, yes. where suddenly a great many discussions of classical liberal libertarian ideas, yes. even objectivist ideas, started to flower. And how did you manage to do that? I'd love to say something about that. I was, when I was offered the job as head of the philosophy department at USC, it was not usually commented that with that job came the editorship of their long-standing journal entitled The Personalist. Uh, and so I automatically became editor of that. So I thought, well, here's an opportunity. Uh, I gradually came to accept and publish articles of a libertarian orientation, such as yours, for example, and a number of others you know, uh, as well. Uh, Doug Denial, Doug Rasmussen, uh, and... Uh, uh, Fred Miller, Fred Miller and, uh, yeah. Jeffrey Paul, Jeffrey and Paul. a whole bunch of other people. They all, Lauren Lomoski. And they all published in, in, in the personalism. And I was happy and proud to, uh, uh, to, to, to publish those because they were, an area, they were in an area of intellectual life in which uh, most magazines connected with universities didn't care to publish it. Uh, they were too, so statist-oriented that they... they they shied away from this sort of thing. So I thought, well, in the interest of objectivity, I'm not going to shy away from this. The article has to be worthy, but I'll be happy and proud to publish these people. And I'm more than ever glad that, that I did that at the time. Well, that was a very big help to many of those people whom you published at the time. Interestingly enough, it was only a 
two years later in 73 or 4 that Nozick began to publish, uh, first in the philosophy and public affairs mm -hmm. and then his book. But your work in The Personalist preceded this by several years. And uh, there were many people who were beginning to debate and argue out these issues, which, as you say, previously did not see the light of day anywhere else. Nozick himself began with this article on the Randian art That's argument, right. which I published in The Personalist. Which came out of a conference that you and I That's uh, right. held in 1970. That, that memorable conference of 1970 right. that filled the auditorium, and people are still talking about I that know. one. <laughs> In this connection, you have been quite uh, active in contributing to the debate, for example, about the extreme, say, libertarian anarchist wing and the libertarian limited government wing. I remember essays of yours in Reason magazine and in many other forums where you discuss this. Where do you end up on this debate? As of now, I will take limited government because it seems to me to offer the best prospects for freedom in our time or future time. I'm just uncertain how anarchism would really work out in theory. I mean, on paper, it's it's very nice. I mean, just as you, you don't have any enforced defense, uh, you don't you don't have to pay for the policeman because you hire your own policeman. You hire wh whom you want to defend you, and your neighbor will de 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 hire whom he wants to defend him. And uh, this gets very complicated. Uh, two people in the same city block could have two different defense agencies. Uh, and then th there has to be an arbitration agency to arbitrate between or among those defense agencies. And uh, then they could be at odds with one another. They could conceivably be at war with one another. That is exactly what Hobbes said uh, about competing, uh, he didn't say defense agencies, competing police forces within the same geographical area. He said, he said this, that this was civil war, although he said, though not war, neither is it peace. And if you had competing agencies and nobody, no Supreme Court, as it were, to make the decision over them, I don't know how that would turn out. It might be utter chaos. You see, I, I don't trust it. How do you think that in America, which had such a classical liberal libertarian foundation or founding, the intellectual community could become so dominated by this alien near socialist, almost completely egalitarian viewpoint, that it is the accepted doctrine at most universities that deal with these subjects. It takes a long time to slide down that way, but the slide has been steady. Uh, well, for a century it held. William uh, McKinley, even in the 1890s, vetoed uh, even a small welfare benefit, uh, because he said this was not compatible with, the, uh, not authorized by the Constitution. And many previous presidents have said that. Not many have said that since. Do you think that perhaps this horrible experience with slavery weakened the American resolve that had been so grand at first? Well, slavery was certainly the biggest fly in the ointment of the Constitution. Even the Constitution couldn't eliminate it because the, uh, the South would never have come into the Union, and who knows you know, what would have happened without the South. It's one of those ifs, I don't know. But yes, it might well have been a factor. But I think, in general, you know, Lincoln was right in his very early talks to the Lyceum in Illinois when he said that these things will happen imperceptibly, the state has the power and it will use it more and more, and more and more measures will be passed to, to regulate uh, the citizenry. And, he's, and uh, he said, look, if you are an aspiring Caesar or Alexander, uh, what are you going to do? We want to be just a footnote to history uh, that you are author of this or that legislation. No, you'll want to take over the the, the whole government and uh, create an era of your own, as Napoleon did. Usually, that's done not for good but for evil. But 
that's the way uh, the way it turned out. So liberty is always under assault. It's always under assault. And the bigger the government gets, the more we de come to depend on it. We depend on it for social security, welfare, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, and so people get used to the idea, well, my financial well-being depends upon the government. I couldn't do without it, now could I? Have you found the natural rights tradition per se as a valuable one for uh, showing the justice of a free society? Yes, but it doesn't. I certainly have myself. Right, so it doesn't. You have to have a certain amount of skill and patience to get this really through people's heads. Uh, sometimes I would just try doing it in a much in a simpler way, though it's not not doing as much. If I just if I say, well, here's here's the grounding of of, of rights. Uh, uh, there's suppose there's just the two of us. There's you. There's me. You don't want me to to interfere with your life. I don't want you to interfere with my life. So we have an agreement, and the agreement. We, we then we stick to that agreement and now we have the right to be not interfered with. Now if you also want, suppose you say, well, I also want welfare uh, and uh, uh, maybe we should agree on that. And then I say, oh, you mean that I'm to be liable if you get sick, if you want a change of, 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 of life course and any number of other things that the government is now in hock for? Uh, or that we're in hock for. I uh, said, no, no, not so fast. Uh, I, I will not grant you that much. It's, it, could, it could ruin my life. It could take that much more out of my life. So I'm not going in for that part of the bargain. Now this, I think people see very quickly. It's very simple. You this don't bother me, I don't bother you. That, that's a contractarian approach. Right. So generally speaking, are you what might be called optimistic about the prospects? of a society of individual liberty where the default position is individual rights rather than state meddling? Look, I'm optimistic in certain ways, but it, so much of it depends upon contingencies that we cannot control. I mean, uh, libertarians, for instance, hope that the Libertarian Party is one day going to win the election. And I don't see any prospect in the immediate future of this. But if you look at the Republican Party in 1856, uh, it's not that they had done such extraordinary things, but the Whig Party was in the process of dissolution through internal strife. And so then we get the new Republican Party and Abraham Lincoln becomes the next president. Now, who would have thought that a couple of years before? Not, not Lincoln himself or anyone else would have thought that. But it happened through happenstance, the happenstance of the dissolution of, a, of one of the two reigning parties in the United States. This could happen again. What are you working on these days? Well, at my age, I shouldn't be working at much, but I did in the last six months complete three rather long papers. Mm -hmm. One hasn't yet appeared, it'll appear next month, Ayn Rand's Theory of Art. Mm. So you are dealing still with aesthetics. Oh yes. And oh yes. Have you reached any conclusions on what is of aesthetically valuable? What is the highest value in art? It's such an easy question to ask, but it's it's tough to answer because the the issues involved are very great. It used to be thought or said that every work of art has to have certain conditions in order for it to be aesthetically valuable. You have to have, uh, number one, as Aristotle said, organic unity, uh, the unity appropriate to an organism, not to a mechanical collection of things. Anyone who's in the arts knows what I mean, I think, by that. And then there's the complexity within unity because it's utter simplicity doesn't yield anything. There may also be development. There are other criteria that different people have suggested and uh, I still think the Aristotelian criterion is a very good one. If you want for, to discuss all of the arts, uh, you know, literature, music, film, everything. But here individual tastes differ so enormously 
And I certainly can't go about revising people's temperaments, especially since that's what they're born with. Some people like classical, other go to the romantic. Uh, and uh, I'd say there's nothing wrong with either of them, but they're, they're certainly different. And in their own consciousness, perhaps irreconcilably different, that there's just no, no, no way from the one, the, the one to the other. You have other things you're working on. Tell us a little bit about that. Well. Uh, I am completed a, a, a paper on Singer's new book on... Uh, Peter Singer, very controversial ethicist. Uh, you know, he's a leader of the uh, animal liberation movement. He has come out with a book that basically says that all of us in the West should give about 30% or one-third of our uh, income to those of uh, other societies and that this is a moral, indeed, probably even a political imperative for him. Uh, did you write on these sorts of things? In part, yes. I, mean, I spent most of his, most of my time on his views on animals. I see. But I also discussed that because many people have pointed out that he makes a good, good many mistakes uh, here. Uh, he should, I think, revert uh, to um, Adam Smith's distinction between virtue and justice. Uh, as, now, as Adam Smith defines these terms, but I think this is something I thought of all the time when I, when I read Singer. Uh, justice, he said, is easily summarized uh, you don't invade other person's person. You don't invade another person's liberty. You don't invade another person's property. And those, he says, are the rules that should be, the only rules that should be enforceable by law. This is Adam Smith. Adam Smith. On the other hand, you have ethics having to do with virtue uh, well, he, again, he uses virtue perhaps in a special way, as many people today also do. So that's, that's hard to unpack quickly. But he, here, the lead question is this. Uh, Aristotle said, we should each be virtuous in our own way, but it's, you cannot say in advance to whom one should be generous and for what one should be generous and in what circumstances would be generous, uh, and so on and so on, so on for, for, for other virtues. And... Uh, but one should not be penalized legally for not being those things. This, after all, is virtue, not justice. I have a whole list of uh, remarks about uh, Singer on, on this subject. But more interesting to me is his view about, not about animal rights, which no, he barely not, discusses, no. but about mistreatment of animals. And here I really go a long ways uh, with him. When I first read... Uh, Animal liberation. Animal liberation. I was just bowled over because, you see, my recollection of Iowa farms was this. You have contented cattle in the, in, in the fields. They're, they're, they're grazing. Uh, and the same with horses and, and, and other animals, livestock. Then, then I read Animal Liberation. And this, you know, this really knocked me over. Uh, I thought, well, when he, description of veal calves and they're not being ever allowed to leave these narrow stalls and not even not to turn around and so on and so on. Or cows being dismembered even before they're, before they're even dead, you know, in, in the... Uh, slaughterhouses. In the slaughterhouse and so on. Uh, my first instinct was, well, we got to change the law. I did not suggest legally abolishing the raising of animals mm -hmm. for food. It's not going to happen anyway. But I felt and still feel that laws that permit this sort of thing to happen, the immense degree of suffering of animals, the, the, we can do something about that. Now, the vast majority of cases of animal suffering we cannot prevent. They're out in nature. Now, why can't it be something like this? We do inflict pain on animals, and they do suffer the pain, but the result of 
research in laboratory research or cosmetics or uh, culinary delights and so on are so great that it makes it all worthwhile. And Singer himself says that uh, animal experimentation is not always wrong because sometimes it pays off handsomely in curing a human disease or for that matter disease of the animals. But what I wanted in general to, to touch on was this. Many people would say the following, you may do that, plan your life, some plus, some minus, some pleasure, some pain, and so on. You can, you're welcome to do that with your own life, that's your life. But please don't play around with my life that way. Example, there's an example given by another Australian philosopher, J.J. C. Smart. He says, suppose that I could elect to inflict 10 units of pain on Jones, but on Smith and Robinson, they'll get 50 units of enjoyment each. Well, surely that's worth it in the utilitarian calculus. Of course, jo Jones might not like this, but Jones is outvoted, you see. And the point is, we should not inflict that pain on Jones without Jones's consent. But that's a that's rights a, argument. That's no that's, longer a utilitarian right. argument. I know. That's, so Singer is not entitled to that. That's right. This is transition from, we're now, this is a transition from utilitarian arguments to rights arguments. What other kind of works do you see in the future? Well, I don't know if there will uh, be any. What I, my habit of late years has been to write an occasional paper on this or that subject as it interested me. Subjects not entirely, not very closely related to each other. I mean, you know, nuclear energy, Ayn Rand's aesthetics, animal rights. I mean, uh, <laughs> you couldn't find more disparate things in, in, the, in the community. Well, but yet if something takes my fancy, mm -hmm. th that's what I'll do with it. And I might write it for publication or I might not. Well, thank you very much, John. This was a very interesting uh, set of uh, uh, issues and conversations, and uh, thank you again. Thank you very much.